Thanks, Tim. So hello, everyone. Welcome to Comet PFT Community Call. Uh, I already announced on most channels the, the agenda for today, so I'm going to share my screen and just quickly run through it so that we're on the same page. And please uh, stop me if you would like to add anything else to the agenda. And uh, if you do, then we're, we're just going to add it here and we can, uh, uh, we can also dive into that topic. What we, uh, what we thought it would be important to discuss today would be these three uh, broad topics, the, the release of O38. Uh, this uh, is potentially encountering some delays. Uh, we have the option not to delay it, so we wanted to consult the community on this. Uh, the second topic would be the uh, fully unsynchronized APCI client. This has been discussed multiple times in, in, uh, in Slack, I think at least once or twice on Twitter also and in, uh, uh, in issues in our repo, uh, and it has performance implications. And then the last uh, one that we added so far would be uh, gathering some feedback from network operators, uh, validators and so on, who uh, on, on their uh, configuration for the mempool size and the cache size. If, uh, if anyone has any other topics that they would like to discuss, it might be useful to add them already so that we, uh, we know them ahead of time and we know how to allocate time and so on with, uh, among the, the, the topics. I suspect not. So, Tane, is it okay if I hand it over to you and you take over the first topic? Sure. Thanks. So, as I'm sure most people are aware, we have our O380 release candidate out. It's been out for some time now. And the SDK has been integrating their O50 release with our O38 release candidate. And so apparently from what, what we can gather from the rest of the stack, uh, the so IBC still needs to make changes before they're ready to to um to release their corresponding release that works with uh SDK O50. And the current ETA on that is sometime around the end of Q3 or even perhaps during Q4 of 2024. So it's a, an ecosystem blocker. It's not blocking the SDK or uh, Comet. But I mean, for people who do depend on the SDK plus IBC, like this would effectively block them from being able to upgrade fully. That, that's my current understanding of the situation. So, but for users who don't depend, either users who don't depend on the SDK directly, uh, we could potentially cut Comet 0380, the final release. We've done our QA on it. Um, we, we have all the features in it that we know we want to ship. Uh, and so far from the SDK's QA process, we haven't had any, um, any issues come up over there. So we're quite happy with, uh, with potentially cutting a release now. The only downside to doing that is that our releases start to then pile up where we already have 037 out. That's been out for some time. It's still taking time for that to make its way onto main nets at this point. Then we have, we'll have 038 out and that'll also be out for quite some time before it actually hits main nets due to um, the IBC blocker. Uh, and then we'll start working on our 039 release, but then that may only hit main nets sometime towards the end of uh, next year at this rate middle of next year to end of next year, depending depending on what kinds of changes we, we make in 039, because the, the feature set in 039 isn't fully uh, finalized just yet. So I mean, the other alternative is that we hold off on cutting the final Comet 038 release now uh, until the whole stack is ready. And then we try to get some of the work that we've been doing this quarter that we were scheduling for our 039 release, so bandwidth and storage optimizations. Uh, we, we tried to get some of that work into our 038 release during this quarter still. Um, and that would obviously delay our final 038 zero release, but uh, then we may be able to release with the entire stack together. Um, so those are two of our options at the moment. It seems like the, the lower risk option overall is probably the first one. Uh, the slightly higher risk, but potentially more valuable option is to try to get some more of our um, uh, current work from this quarter into our O38 release. Uh, and things like, for example, on the bandwidth optimization front, I understand that from for a number of users, 
one of the big hindrances to making use of both of the egg bud extensions is the bandwidth consumption issue. So we're hoping that by reducing bandwidth consumption of other parts of the system, like mempool gossip, that's one of the areas we're focusing on at the moment, we'll be able to effectively free up additional space in the pipe, so to speak, for bud extensions so that the, the latencies over there are not as, uh, uh, as much of a hindrance. So those are two of the options we have at the moment. We wanted to find out who, if anyone, is keen to get uh, the Comet 038 release out sooner. Um, who's keen to start using it sooner? It'd be, it'd be valuable for us to understand what people's uh, development timelines look like, uh, if there's pressure from uh, for any teams to actually integrate with 038. Keeping in mind, again, that if you depend on Comet 038 and SDK 50 and IBC, you will still be blocked on IBC until such time that IBC releases. But if you don't depend on IBC, if it's just Comet and the SDK, then uh, Comet and the SDK could technically release together sooner than, uh, than IBC. So I don't know if anybody has any feedback or... Uh... Cool. Thanks, Sam, for the thumbs up. Does anybody have any other feedback, any questions, any... Uh... Any concerns you want to raise? And for people watching this uh, after the fact, given that we're recording this, please feel free to reach out to us via one of our communication channels, either via Discord either or via Slack or via Telegram or via Twitter, if, if um, whichever one works best for you. Tane or Sergio, would you say that we have a, a, a recommendation or, or a preferred approach at the moment that we're just going to present to the community and then we're going to go ahead and let people say that it's unlikely to be the best choice? Right now, it seems like, I mean, if there are non-breaking changes that we can get into O38 that will provide additional bandwidth optimizations, if there's some chance that we could make uh, vote extensions more usable by more users as a result, then that, that would be the direction that I would lean. It would require that we do a bit more QA on that release. But so so right now, I would like to go with option two. But again, if anybody is keen on getting the 038 release sooner, um, anyone who's not using the SDK, for example, then please reach out to us and let us know. Because we can also we could also accommodate that um, that timeline. Um, I have a question. I have sure. not tracked the um, QA effort on um, thirty eight like very deeply. I just know that like there was like some bandwidth uh, usage issues with VOD extensions. I guess my question is um, how like how much of a problem it is currently and. Um, has there been like progress generally in that, like fixing it? Um, yeah. So, so the, the sub, oh, sorry, just the, the subtext of my question is uh, if, uh, if it's a big problem, uh, then I would rather personally uh, have a 38 that I know uh, we can use yeah. rather than like uh, presume that like it would work for our use case and then like find out down the road that it doesn't uh, and wait have to wait for another like release exactly so um i mean that is one of the reasons why we're sort of leaning towards option two but um the 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 thing is that vote extensions are not unusable right so what we've demonstrated in our qa report which is in on the o38x branch you can take a look in our docs in in the qa uh folder we've got an extensive qa report there the the bandwidth consumption scales linearly with the number of validators in your network and also with the size of the vote extension data itself. So it's really dependent on the network and it's also very dependent on the size of the transactions or the data that you embed into vote extension, uh, into the vote extensions. So for some users, it will be feasible for them to use vote extensions as is. For other users, it's not feasible for them to use it as is. And again, it's totally dependent on the use case, which is why we're trying to solicit some feedback from the community on who, who has a burning need for vote extensions right now, because there are some, some bandwidth optimizations we can release in non-breaking releases of Comet. So we can progressively optimize the bandwidth consumption in non-breaking releases like 038.1, 038.2, et cetera. 
uh, but then there are some types of changes that will have to be breaking. So if we refactor the entire mempool gossip protocol, for example, then that'll potentially be a breaking change. There may be ways in which we could accommodate that in a non-breaking way, like by a feature flagging it, but we still have to see concretely, like you know, what, what we'll do over there to, to make sure that it's non-breaking. Yeah, to comment so the question. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, just two two more things. So any complementing what Thane said, any improvement that we that requires some sort of like new new message type, et cetera, at the P2P level will be breaking change because then uh, unless we can prove that it's interoperable, but that's like a tricky thing to do. And the second thing I wanted to say about the QA. So one thing we tend to forget about the QA, the the you know, the thing we presented about VOR extensions and their cost in terms of bandwidth is that the tests that we did where with first, first of all an, artif an artificial demo application we don't really have yet today a set of tests like performance tests with a realistic application one and two the infra as we have it now or as we had it at the time of running those tests remember that the all the nodes even if they were real nodes in a, in a data center all the nodes were located in the same data center so the latencies among them was artificially low as compared to a real uh, test net out there or a real, a real mainnet out there with more heterogeneous latencies. And we know that the fact that we did, mm, the, the way some of the algorithms for the gossiping work, um, test beds that artificially have low latencies tend to exaggerate the amount of, say, amplification or useless information that is uh, gossiped, which means that like the the um, the results you see there is like a lower bound of what you will find. So you won't, you know, depending on the application or depending on the latencies, probably will have slightly or or, or notably better performance. This was just something we we, we put out just to, to give you guys the like the lowest bound of you know how, like worst case scenario basically. Yeah, it's counterintuitive, but. As so you're saying, like with realistic latencies in the system, you may actually get better performance. So, but that's that again, it's very much app, it's very application specific. It's hard for us to tell from where we sit. That's true. Okay. Thank you both for answering the question. That's helpful. Sure. Everyone, I, I also linked into the from the community call agenda the the results and the uh, the very, very brief takeaway is that if vote extensions per validator exceed uh, the vicinity of like uh, of around uh, four kilobytes, if I'm reading it correctly, uh, then you will start impacting latency. We'll go into more and more rounds. You see that at four kilobytes, there's already three rounds. Actually, four kilobytes, there's also already three rounds. Uh, but it's most visible when you go at 16 kilobytes that you go to four and five rounds and 32 kilobytes. Uh, as well, I think uh, this is what uh, what I remember. And the second remark that I can add is that uh, the skip team have been looking at uh, our tests, and they're planning planning to integrate uh, the, their own application actually, so that they recreate the results and they can see what is a more uh, realistic uh, experimental scenario and what will that yield. And with that. Unless there is other questions on this topic or vote extensions impact. Um, if anyone is interested, uh, we can also look into upstreaming. We have a content addressable mempool that is backwards compatible with the existing mempools. So this has been tested and um, we had like a roughly 20 X improvement in bandwidth. So it might be something to look into. It's not very well, like it's, it's tested in like the end-to-end -end test and our network tests, but um, we're soon going to test it on like a, a live test net with um, even more validators and even more uh, nodes in the network than our other test net. But um, I'll, I'll uh, post some links in the chat if anyone's interested. Awesome, thanks very much. Yeah, I know um, Hernan was mentioning this uh, earlier this week. Uh, it was one of the, one of the options that our um, the, the folks working on the bandwidth optimization we're looking into is actually upstreaming the Celestia um, content addressable mempool. So um, it is definitely an option we want to investigate. 
Ivan, on that front, the best person to get in contact is yourself and Callum. Is that correct? Yeah, myself or Callum. Callum did most of the work on it, so he's probably the best, but I can I can substitute if needed. Thanks. Thanks, appreciate that. All right, going once, going twice, and we're gonna go to the fully unsynchronized ABCI client, which I think they, uh, it's your uh, your neck of the woods again. Sure. So I don't know how many how many people are familiar with how the client um, interface works from within Comet. Um, for people for Go app, this is this primarily applies to Go application developers and especially folks using the SDK. So effectively, um, just for those who don't, don't know the details, um, Comet is a client to the ABCI application. And so we have what's called, uh, so, so we, we, we have um, ABCI clients that we maintain from within Comet. There's one client per quote unquote connection to the application. There's like one, it's a, one, one for consensus, one for access in the mempool and check TX, one for uh, snapshots and uh, one for querying. So there's four, that, that's how the remote connection works. And the, the model is somewhat similar for the local client um, when interacting with Go-based applications, but um, our local client proxy effectively and historically has always had a single mutex over all of those connections. So what ends up happening is anytime the query method is called from Comet, it blocks consensus and vice versa. If you have multiple query, query calls, so basically this one mutex serializes all access to the application. And obviously this is problematic. Like we, we need a better um, uh, concurrency model for Comet to interact with the application. And so we've been thinking about different ways of approaching this. And one, one approach is just to fully offload the responsibility for managing concurrency to the application. So in that case, that, that's the other extreme. So the, the one extreme is Comet has a, a single mutex over all of these connections, which obviously doesn't work, it doesn't scale. The other extreme is Comet does away with all of those mutexes altogether and there's the application manages all the concurrency itself. Now, there are some pros and cons to that sort of approach where uh, for us, I imagine that at least the consensus connection for the most part, the, the interactions there from Comet side should be serialized. So what I've done in, in these pull requests or in this particular pull request, uh, I think it's 1141 there, is to introduce two additional uh, models for interaction from uh, from Comet side. And this is something that you can use uh, as an application developer when instantiating your application. Instead of using the local client creator, the standard local client creator, you can, you can use, uh, there are two over here where there's a connection synchronized local client creator, which simulates locally what the remote socket client does. In other words, with the remote socket client, you have these four TCP connections between Comet and the ABCI application, and all requests and responses are serialized onto those four different TCP connections. So the, the connection synchronized local client creator effectively creates one mutex per virtual connection between, the, between Comet and the application. So that gives you the exact same behavior as what the remote interface would. Then there's another model where we have a, a consensus synchronized local client creator, which is all, this is also a little bit suboptimal and I'll explain why now, at least in the context of 038. But the consensus synchronized local client creator has no mutexes on any of the other connections except for just consensus. So all of Comet's consensus related calls to the application will be serialized, but none of the other calls. So check TX, query, uh, accessing sna snapshot data, et cetera, would be synchronized. So all of that could actually occur in parallel. The downside of this in the context of vote extensions, at least the consensus synchronized local client creator is that technically you, you should be able to, um, at least in theory, from what I understand, uh, you should be able to, to execute um, uh, the vote extension related uh, calls. 
in consensus in parallel to the other consensus related calls. It's, it's only the, the primary calls of prepare a process proposal and finalize block and commit that should be serialized from Comet's perspective. So I wanted to get folks feedback on this. Feel free to comment on the pull re request itself. Feel free to give us feedback now and what you think of, uh, in this regard. Um, we are also, for folks who are building non-SDK-based applications, say Rust-based based applications, we are looking into other protocols for um, facilitating a greater concurrency between Comet and the application. But we have to change some of the underlying networking protocols to be able to facilitate that. So again, like if you do, if you do have any feedback on this, feel free to um, to give us the feedback now or on the pull request over here. But we'd like to. The nice thing about this is it still conforms to the same interface that so it doesn't break the or at least this change over here. I've I've kind of uh, fleshed out the interface a little bit more for the, the client creator, uh, but. The, this uh, you could technically actually roll your own um, client creator uh, from your own application's perspective, and then when you're wiring up a node, you can supply your own as long as you implement the interface. You can supply your own concurrency control effectively, but we would like to supply some some uh, client creators that we believe are let's say sane and and supportable from our perspective, from Com's perspective. I know Buzz is not here, but it seems to me like the only concern was uh, the SDK team wanting to have full concurrent calls. I, I know Buzz hasn't answered it. And he's not here. I suspect Sam doesn't have Buzz's context. No. So I could try to ping him. I can ping him now. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy with also adding a fully unsynchronized local client creator over here. And then again, it's up to the application to ensure that the concurrency yeah. of all those calls is serialized effectively so that you don't end up with a situation where you're calling like process proposal process proposal after uh, commit, for example, for a particular height and round. Like there's, there needs to be some form of um, concurrency control over there and serialization of certain requests. But uh, then using a fully unsynchronized client would put all that responsibility on the shoulders of the application developer. Yeah, the other concern was uh, beside Bez, it seems like this is also already used. Uh, I remember Luke, yeah, Lucas from DYDX also mentioning in, uh, in another PR somewhere or issue that they are also big fans of the fully unsynchronized one. So, sure. I mean, if, if folks want the unsynchronized one, that's trivial to, to implement. I can expand this PR and add that in as well. And then progressively over time, we can prune away the, the ones that people don't use. Um, or we could just we could just offer the unsynchronized local client creator and then see you know if that's something that people would rather use. Again, like you're free, it's just an interface that you have to implement in Go. And you're free to create, um, you can use this as an example of how to create a local client creator uh, for your own application. Just for context, so uh, I think by the time we cut the first RC for 38, this actually was also in the agenda for the com call. Marco was Marco Marisic from from DSK was present there. I remember that like kind of the conclusion, at least from his perspective, was that they they that 038 could be the, the way it is, like because the question there was like, should we kind of squeeze something of some some of these into 038? The conclusion was from the SDK point of view, it was not necessary, but that would be good to have in the next release to have the fully unsynchronized. So yeah, that, that was kind of like the, the, the yeah. place we stopped uh, last time. So this over here at least just gives developers the option of using it. Like as it currently stands, the, the standard local client creator with the giant mutex over all of the connections um, will will still be present in the code base. We're not removing that entirely because, you know, that could open up a whole can of worms with the SDK. Um, I mean, it needs to be tested to, to you know, making making SDK based applications fully concurrent. Um, and again, that may also be something application specific that needs to be done. But at least with this PR over here, then you have the option as the application developer, as a Go application developer, 
uh, to make use of uh, fully unsynchronized local client creator if you want it. I would like to stress because you, you have explained it very well, Thane, but just to make sure people that don't have the full context that this is like really understood, the fully unsynchronized client only applies to the local client, meaning people that are writing applications in Go and they are basically part of the same process as, exactly. um, as Comet. The rest, I mean, this unsynchronized client does not apply to the rest because among other things, does not make sense. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, so, so um, there's still work to be done on the remote client uh, side where one of the problems on the remote client side is that all queries uh, via Comet are effectively serialized and that can be pretty heavy. Um, but generally the serialization and, th and also all the check TX uh, requests are all also serialized uh, between Comet and um, the remote application. So that, that is an area of potential optimization in the future, but we would have to change the networking protocol to be able to accommodate that. And that's, that's still a, a, a way away. We have some issues up for that. I can see if I can find the issue where I did a write-up on that. But um, yeah, uh, we're mainly considering just the local clients. So just Go-based applications and so mostly applications using the Cosmos SDK. All right, it seems like there's you no know, concerns about uh, about potentially adding the fully unsynchronized client. It doesn't have to be hurried up into O38, but it could be in O39. Cool. Cool. Fair enough. Next up. Yes. Um... So this is a question for the community. We would like to get some feedback on the um, how the you use the uh, configuration for the mempool. So uh, usually the, the typical case is that uh, the, the, the cache, the, the, the size of the cache of the mempool is much bigger than the, the mempool itself. So this is that the default values are like this. Uh, and um, this is a, the typical scenario where uh, um, how how the, it's maybe supposed to be used uh, the size uh, of the cache bigger than the, the mempool. As you may know, the the, the cache is uh, not only a, a cache of transactions for the mempool. It's also used to to uh, avoid uh, processing duplicate transactions. So um, if we know that uh, this is uh, not the case that uh, the, the you are using maybe a cache smaller or even disable uh, the caches, uh, then we could simplify the code and uh, reduce the, the the number of tests in the, the code. So uh, yeah, we would like to know if uh, any of you is using a scenario like that, configuration like that. Um, yeah, it could be good to have some feedback. Um, either now or later on the on Slack or one of the channels of communication. Maybe uh, Duke or uh, Nan, I know you guys are with, uh, with Notional. I was wondering if, you, if you're part of the crew that does the operations or validation. Do you have any insights on, uh, on cache configuration versus mempool configuration capacity wise? I guess uh, they're not here. Yeah, yeah. What I, what I would do is, if we have no input in the community call, and since this is being recorded, what I would propose to do, uh, Hernan, let me, sweet, let me know if you agree, is that to us, it doesn't make sense to configure the cache size slow, uh, mo smaller than the mempool size, right? Right. So it is allowed, it, but it doesn't make too much sense. Exactly. So if the community doesn't come up with I don't know, pathological cases or, 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 or obvious cases that proves that our, our assumptions or our beliefs are wrong, I would basically propose and announce here that, you know, we're, we're going to basically prevent that kind of configurations in a future version. So if somebody uh, sets up a node with uh, a configuration of the cache, which is less, well, but zero, I think zero is allowed, right? You may want to disable the cache. Yeah. But if you enable the cache, the number has to be bigger than the one you put on the mempool capacity. Otherwise, that configuration will not validate. 
is it is it a good like a good way forward? Yes. What do you think? Yeah. I think. Good. Yeah. Sounds like a solid plan. Maybe we can also announce this on basically all channels, and most likely it will land in O39, right? It's it's, it's a way to okay. It would be useful to say. Uh, I think this has potential, uh, there is potential for us to gather more feedback because the validator community tends to be very active on, on other channels. It's just that they don't, don't join the community call as much. It's more developer oriented. So maybe Ali and I can, can spend a bit of time on Discord and on Twitter too, uh, to insist more in gathering feedback. Thanks, Hernan and Sergio. Yeah, and thanks. All right, I give it to Aaron. I see that the, I think you added this here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's just, it's a, it's a small item and I know everyone's busy. Um, I happen to, to uh, request a, a review from Mikhail, but it could be like, you know, anyone. So we would like to explore like having uh, gRPC support on, in Tower ABCI. Um, there are several reasons uh, for that, but bottom line is like the, there's a blocker we need to have the abci server definitions included in tournament dash proto uh it was previously in the past but it got it got janked um with 35 and so this is uh, sort of like a simple um, pr that uh, includes those definitions um so if anyone has time to check it out and review that would be very swell um you know, is the, a lot of this is just code gen, like the the meat of the PR is just having the feature flags and and so on. So yeah, that's that's just it's just like flagging this for uh, visibility. Awesome, and, thanks. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Can check it out. I can look into this now. Thank you so much. Cool. Thanks, awesome. Michal. All right, I think. Uh... I'll give it a few more seconds if, if anyone wants to add anything on the prior topics. Otherwise, uh, I feel like we, we got quite a bit of feedback and uh, we're ready to end early. So each of us gets a bit more time back. Any other All questions right. or anything anybody needs? Otherwise, cool. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks for your right. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks.